Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Keep It Fictional. You are here with me, Fiona, my book friends, Virginia, Corrine, and Gabriel. And today we have a very Canadian episode for you. We will be talking about this year's Canada Reads Picks. If you just somehow don't know what Canada Reads is, um, Canada Reads is a CBC initiative uh, competition uh, where five Canadian authored books head off against one another, each championed by a Canada famous uh, person. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, all of these kind of like joining of Canadian community from from different places, you know, the the champions are usually from all sorts of different industries. Um, and it really gets some books out there. Uh, and our, our hold list for them are huge. Um, so it's a lot of fun, something I look forward to every year. This year, uh, Canada Reads is taking place on March 28th to March 31st. And it will be hosted by Ali Hassan. And this year's theme is one book to connect us all oh it's actually just one book to connect us but i uh, it kind of sounds like the lord of the rings to me so it is one book to connect us all and uh the books are being championed by vogue fashion writer christian allaire five little indians which is by michelle good um, Malaya Baker is championing, championing Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez. And that one uh, will not be championed by any of us today, not because it's not a great book, just because there's only four of us and there's five books. Uh, what Strange Paradise is being championed by Tarek Haddad, uh, a personal favorite of mine. He is a chocolate maker, a Syrian refugee uh, in Nova Scotia and uh, Peace by Chocolate is company, and it's fantastic. Uh, City of Dirty Water by Thomas Mueller. It's being championed by Suzanne Simard. And uh, Washington Black by Mark Tewksbury. So lots of great Canadian names there. And of course, today, we will each be championing our own. Uh, if you are getting tired of hearing my voice, tough. I'm going to go first. <laughs> so today, I will be talking about Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Um, so this is a book about uh, the re residential school system in the 60s. Uh, it actually takes place uh, during the lives of uh, five children who were sent to residential schools after they leave the schools. Uh, it takes place in BC and uh, many of the characters end up living in Vancouver um, with some very specific locations called out, um, which was pretty neat to read as someone who lives in Vancouver and just saying, oh, you know, at the junction of Maine and Hastings and being able to actually like picture where that, that is was really neat. And again, uh, really drives home especially um, since this is a little later than, than some of the other books that I've read about the residential school system, really driving home, this happened here. This happened in our lifetime. Um, it is a very readable book. Um, it has five perspectives. Um, and despite being very heavy and upsetting, um, is a quick read um, that is deeply moving. So uh, my favorite character was Lucy. Um, she is a naive, quiet, kind of dreamy girl. Um, and during her time at residential school, uh, she's called a liar by one of the nuns uh, for um, speaking up about what the uh, father is doing to her. Uh, so obviously um, there are 
instances of sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, and, you know, some very difficult things uh, to hear about. So, um, of course, the, the nun doesn't believe her, um, and she shaves Lucy's head, and she puts a sign around her that says liar and makes her stand up in front of all of the other kids. Um, well, this is when um, Kenny steps in. Kenny is uh, the, the golden boy to all of the other students because he is always fighting back. He constantly trying to run away and he takes the time when no one is looking to walk up to Lucy and let her know you're strong, you can do this. However, after this, uh, Kenny vanishes and the staff tell everyone that he has drowned in an escape tent. However, we know that Kenny has not drowned. Uh, he has actually escaped. He's gone back home um, and uh, with the help of a caring uncle um, is hidden from the school and uh, doesn't have to go back. Now, there's a bit of a love story between Lucy and Kenny, um, which was which was a beautiful connection. And I think at the heart of this book, it is really looking at connections um, and the difficulty uh, that trauma and intergenerational trauma creates in connections. So this is something that I've read about and, you know, acknowledge, but it really drove it home for me and it helped me to understand. Like when Kenny, um, you know, he has escaped, he's gotten out, like it's a miracle, it's amazing. There's so much to be happy about. Um, but when he goes home, he comes home to, you know, a mother he's been dreaming about and she's broken. She's completely broken um, from losing her son. And even though he's back, that trauma that they both share but can't speak about um, creates a wall between them. Uh, she's turned to alcoholism. And this, the description of the kids, uh, you know, whether they age out or escape and come home and, and what they've been dreaming about, and then to come home and find everything changed and find themselves changed is, um, it just really helped me to understand uh, why these pieces can't be be put back together. Um, that it, there's there's healing to be done for these characters that can't just be fixed. It can't just be ignored. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of books that you can read right now. There are fantastic books about uh, the legacy of residential schools. This one's a fictionalized one. Um, and but I really feel like it brings that piece so well. Um, and because there's these these characters who you get to know and love and understand, um, it really allows you to empathize in that way. Uh, so so I understand why this is on Canada Reads um, as a book that they believe all Canadians should read um, because it just did that in such a, in an incredible way. Um, there's a few other characters we follow. Clara, um, who becomes a um, activist as when she gets out, um, and her best friend is a wonderful mutt called John Lennon, um, and he is a uh, super cute. Um, and it was really cool to see uh, the the different ways that each of the characters goes, and uh, to see her become become this activist uh, was was really neat at drawing in another part of, of sort of um, another part of the, the political scene. Uh, there's also Howie and then Maisie, uh, whose, whose narrative is very short and deeply, deeply upsetting. Um, so an easy read in terms of the writing style, uh, not an easy read in terms of content, but I really encourage you to read it. Uh, Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Get on that wait list. Um, it'll come to you eventually. I'm going to put this copy back in. So maybe you're the next one to come up.
All right, we got three more Canada reads to go. Why don't we go to Kareen? What have you got for us? All right. Um, I feel like I should fight you, Fiona, because that's kind of like the format of, of Canada Reads, which I enjoy the most, is people like advocating and defending for their book. And so the theme this year was one book to bind us all. <laughs> in the fires of Mount Dune. Um, and so my uh, my pitch of the book that, that can bind us all is um, The City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller. And I guess if in contrast to Fiona's book, which was kind of a, 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 an easier read, although very difficult subject matter, this book is a difficult book to read about difficult subject matter. Um, this is a memoir of a kind of a person with a, a fascinating perspective and a fascinating life. And um, Clayton Thomas Mueller is a Cree environmental activist. Um, he is a um, direct descendant of people who um, survived residential school. He is a uh, domestic and sexual abuse survivor. He is someone who um, was able to leave behind a very difficult lifestyle uh, within gangs um, and, and kind of find himself. The, the, the question that the book really asks is how do you heal? How do you heal yourself? How do you heal from an intergenerational trauma? How do you heal a people? How do you heal a nation? But also, how do we heal the planet? And um, Clayton Thomas Mueller says that healing is a constant thing. It's not just one thing that you do. It's, it's a process that you're constantly going through. It's a well that you're always pulling from. And he has had to kind of pull from that well throughout his entire life to try and heal these these deep fissures these deep gashes that colonialism and and racism and white supremacy have caused to his own people within the nation but also largely in the world as well um the genesis of this particular book is is fascinating so um clayton thomas mueller is for uh tree six Matthias comb cree nation and um, his, his, uh, both his parents attended residential school. Um, his mother became pregnant when she was 15 years old and at that point was put on an airplane and sent to the home for unwed mothers in Winnipeg, which is the titular city of Dirty, of Dirty Water. Um, from there, she uh, raised her family in, in extreme hardship of trying to deal with that trauma and, and also uh, raise her children. Um, but the one thing that she always wanted to do was connect them back to the land and connect them to the, the healing and medicine of their own culture. So every summer um, she would send Clayton back up to live with his, his grandparents in Pakatawa, Pakatawagan, um, where he would kind of spend time, even though he was kind of dealing with some, some really dip, big difficulties in kind of the inner city of Winnipeg, he really did connect to that, that healing, that land, the sweat lodges, um, the ceremonies of, of his people. And he, he kind of says that that is, that is what saved him. Um, yeah. Oh, it is from there. He kind of, um, he kind of details his life as becoming an environmental act, uh, activist, but from an indigenous point of view of trying to heal the land from what colonialism is constantly has taken and what is taken from it. Um, and I think that the actual genesis of this book is really interesting. Um, I did listen to quite a few excerpts of it from an audiobook um, because originally when Clayton Thomas Mueller uh, was inspired to write this book, it was when he was raising his young children and he was having a really hard time connecting with them um, in, in moments of play or in moments of just gentleness. And his therapist said, well, yeah, you, this is because of that trauma is what your, your, what your experience is, is kind of disassociation because at your age, you went through this trauma. And so you're, you're seeing that in your children. And so his therapist uh, recommended that he start writing everything down writing down his life story to kind of help him process with it. And so he said he wrote the entire thing and that it was unpublishable. Um, it was it was too dark, too deep. 
um, and he 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 was very aware that you know it could re-traumatize a lot of people um, by by writing things down in the way that he did. And so what he did is that he went back to his Cree roots, and and, and they were storytellers. That is how they 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 shared their stories and their teachings. And so while he was um, doing his environmental activism against pipelines, against big oil, um, what he would do was with him and a colleague is he would sit down with his with his friend, like a trusted friend. They would put their phone down in the middle of him, and he would just tell him the stories. And he would tell him about his life and about his, his experiences and his healing. And, and he would just sit there and talk through it. And that eventually ended up becoming a documentary film, which you can see on CBC, and eventually became the manuscript for this book. So they took all of these conversations that they had between them, and they just did uh, voice to text, and that ended up being the first manuscript of this book. And while I enjoyed this book, I actually think it would have been stronger and more powerful as an audio book. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Clayton Thomas Mueller, it, is not here to pacify anyone. He's not here to sugarcoat any truths. He is not here not to point fingers. Um, he is uh, wonderfully, um, wonderfully angry as he should be. And I, I really appreciated that in talking about what needs to happen for this nation to fix itself or write itself is that it really does need to confront a lot of these truths and a lot of this trauma of residential school. Um, it has been described as gritty and inspiring. Um, it definitely is gritty. Um, it's hard to read at points. Um, there is uh, a lot of discussion of the reality of his life, whether it be the sexual abuse that his parents or his father suffered or his own. Um, but I think that it's also an important story of how someone um, someone becomes a warrior, how someone can experience all that and still within their own culture find something that that makes them a fighter. Um, I I my money's on this one. My money's on this one, people. It's it's really good. It's it's a it's a difficult read, but I think it is an important read because I think that, you know, as a white settler, I don't really understand what the experience is of an Indigenous person, an Indigenous person in an urban area in Winnipeg, um, where my mom lived for a really long time. So I, I think that it is, I think that in order to come together, we need to understand each other better. In order to connect, we have to accept the ugly parts of ourselves and we have to accept the ugly parts of our history. Um, and that is the only way that we can truly connect. And so for that reason, uh, my, my vote is for City of Dirty Water. Thank you, Corrine. That was so uh, gentle and, and non-confrontational. <laughs> I don't feel attacked at all. <laughs> so hard. <laughs> Well, we'll have to watch closely when um, when they actually have the competition and, you know, sit there and, and root for our, our own books. Okay, um, we are going to move on to Virginia. Um, tell us about what you've got, Virginia. Sure. Um, so I chose uh, What Strange Paradise by Oma Alucard. Um, and this is a story of a refugee experience. Um, and we have on this show talked about a few books that I would like to just promote again one more time um, that we think are great, great stories um, that help us kind of understand and help us get a sense of what it is to be like, uh, what, what their life is like. Um, when Stars Are Scattered by Omar uh, Mohammed and Victoria Jameson, a graphic novel, and also Everything Sad Is Untrue by Daniel Nanayari, both highly, highly recommended on this podcast. Urge you all to read it. Um, both stories are told by the author's personal experience as a refugee um, with such, at least I know for Everything Sad Is Untrue, with such humor um, in, in, in really kind of remind us um, you know, like all the things that we see on media as what we picture when we hear the word refugee and sometimes how wrong that is. Um, 
Omar Alakard is not a refugee himself, but he wrote the story of the global migrant crisis because of his work and how he draws his experience as a journalist for more than 10 years in the Globe and Mail, covering story in Afghanistan, the Arab Spring, um, Guantanamo Bay, and just all that, and, and also how, he, um, because he was born in Egypt and then he moved to Canada when he was a teenager. Um, when he goes back to Egypt, um, he gets to talk to people about their attitudes towards the Syrian refugees. And, and he draw from all of that. And it's a story that has been percolating since 2012. And he started to write this story um, and What Strange Paradise. The story begins with an image that I think many of us remember. And it is what I think sparks like more outrage than anything else. The picture, the photo of body, the body of free year old Ellen Curdy, who drowned in the Mediterranean Sea along with his mother and brother um, in 2015. And that, that the book begins with an image, with a scene just like that. We are on an unnamed island and we see bodies on the beach. Um, this is an island where tourists, is a famous tourist destination where people come and enjoy the beach, enjoy the sun, enjoy the sea. But today the beach is closed because there is another shipwreck and there are bodies everywhere. And as we zoom and focus into this one little boy's body, nine-year-old Amir, his eyes opened. As Amir tried to make sense of where he is, what's happening, what's going on with everybody that is around him, he hears noises and he hears people talking and he tried to sit up and he sees that there are soldiers. There are soldiers walking towards close by walking towards him and he knows that he needs to go he needs to run he needs to get himself up and run away and so he tries his best to get up and he start running and when the soldiers bought movement they follow him they started to give chase and he's just crashing into everything trying to get away and finally he comes to a house and he he stopped because there was a girl in front of the house and they stare at each other for a while. Meanwhile, in the background, you can hear the noises of the soldiers and the girl motioned him to come in, to go into the barn and try to communicate to him to stay silent, to stay hidden. They can't communicate because they speak different language, but she tried her best to, to let him know that it's okay. I mean, you no harm. And so Amir from inside the barn watches the girl walk back outside and then as the soldiers approach, they exchange words. And then they, he saw the girl pointing far away, away from the house, away from the barn. And so the soldiers started moving that direction in pursuit again. And from there, we get the story in a before and after. After is when we have Amir, nine-year-old, and Vanna, the girl, not that much older, and how they try to evade the soldiers, how they try to figure out, well, now what? What, what should we do with Amir? Who, who can we go to to maybe get help that won't send them, won't send him back to the soldiers? And then the before, when we count the story of how Amir gets here, how he and his family has fled from Syria to Egypt, and while they were waiting there for help, how Amir unknowingly ended up on a boat, a mere fishing boat that is not equipped at all to make that journey that is supposed to carry him and more than 100 passengers towards this promised land of the West. What Strange Paradise is, I, I feel like it's a story very much about dichotomies or maybe what, what seems like dichotomies at the time, um, how we as humans like to put group things. We like to pit things against each other from the story structure with the before and after and how 
in some way knowing the end of the story right from the beginning, knowing actually what happens to these migrants, how, how that changes the way you read the story when you hear how they got there. And then the writing itself, it feels very sparse. Sometimes they almost feel clinical in some ways, but yet there are so many scenes and so many words, so many commentaries that, that evoke such powerful emotions, whether it is emotions of anger, of shame sometimes, of how we look at ourselves, forces us really to look at ourselves. How do we, how do we see refugees? And the dichotomy of hope and despair what led all these migrants to get on this tiny little boat to make a journey? And, and they pay an exuberant amount of money to get on the boat. And if you want a life jacket, you have to pay extra. And that life of just how hopeless and how helpless it is. But yet we have Vanna who doesn't have anything that she really can offer, but she decides that she's going to hide this boy that she has never met before. And along the way, they meet people that offers them really little acts of kindness. Just even just as someone who just decides to look the other way and not yell and draw attention to these two kids or someone who offers to give them a chocolate bar, these tiny little acts of kindness is so it means so much to Vanna and especially to Amir. And then we have the concepts of local and foreign, local and alien, and just that in itself, how that determines how you're being treated and what rules apply to you. And I think one of the most powerful quote in the book um, is when one of the passengers on the boat they're trying to tell the others how naive they are in thinking that the West is going to help them. And they said there are two kinds of people in the world. They're not good or bad. They're engines and fuel. Go ahead, change your country, change your name, change your accent, pull the skin right off your bones. But in their eyes, they will always be the engines and you will always, always be fuel. And all these, all these dichotomies, it forces you and Omalaka forces us to chew on these really bitter questions and forces us to wrestle, I think, with maybe the Canada Re question. What, what connects us all? And what, what, is for, what is making us think that these people are different from us? And I think it's, it's everybody, not just the readers, that's going to be questioning what they believe and what they know. The characters themselves, they're all questioning, why are we doing this? Why are we on this boat? And the soldiers are questioning, why, why is it so urgent that we have to round up all these people? Why? Why do we need to make sure that they ended up process like the way they want them to? And I think perhaps because I have had some opportunities to to actually hear and meet some of the stories with migrants in persons that I, I find the, the scenes for me that are most powerful in this book is, is it's the ones on the boat and hearing their words their hopes and and their debate about whether they would be saved and what their future would be like, um, especially between Amir and this other pregnant woman on the boat um, who has sort of taken Amir like under her wing and, and how at one point she, she shared an apple slice with him and everybody was laughing at her. It's like, why you have to, you have to feed two people. Why are you sharing? Why are you giving away food for free? And, and how Amir when, when he got this apple slice, he, he was like, Ugh, it's, it's dirty, I, I, I need to wash it. And, and how we forget the dignity that we all deserve and that we want to have no matter where we are. Um, and then with the pregnant woman and how she, she has to, and some of them, they talk about how they have to adopt English names, never like make sure you adopt English names um, because that's how they can relate to you. And some of them will carry crosses because that, again, it shows them, oh, you are one of them. 
like and 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 that's how she even though she doesn't know english she doesn't she can speak the language she practiced this few lines that she was told just make sure you can say these few lines and you will get help and so throughout the whole journey she keeps saying to herself hello i'm pregnant i will have a baby on april 28 i need hospital and doctor to have safe baby please help and she just say that over and over and over again and how everybody made fun of her because people think that that nothing is going to help you where you think you're going is not going to be what you think it is and I think, I, I don't want to spoil the ending of the book, but the beginning and the ending of the book, it kind of begins and ends in the same place. And it is so fitting because it shows us how easy it is for us to get, it's just like me right now, getting really enraged in like thinking about the book, thinking about sort of like the state of the world and that how easy it is the next day for us to forget, forget about the whole thing. And, and Omar Alakart is hoping that he writes this book and he won't let us forget. He doesn't want us to forget. And he hope that this story will make sure that we will always remember um, the story of people that we meet and that, you know, how all of them deserves life, deserves a space, deserves happiness, deserves a future. Um, so if you are looking for another great, great story to get sort of to get to know and, and to kind of really experience this refugee experience highly highly recommended what strange paradise by omar alacard thank you virginia it sounds like a beautiful um and very human book okay um i'm gonna take a deep breath <sighs> Um, I thought that we could move on to our um, existential question. Um, and it's really more of a, I don't know, an anecdote or, uh, you know, and I don't <laughs> try not to get like uh, too much into reverence. Um, but uh, I would like to know from each of my book friends, what is a place in Canada that you love. It's a place that's special to you. Could be a specific, you know, business or or a province or or anything. What is a special place? I so I've been a lot of places across Canada. So picking a very specific place, I think, would be really really hard for me. But I know what my gut response is, and. It's New Brunswick, which people might not expect, given that it's a drive-by province, often called the Alberta of the Maritimes. Um, it's a little bit, as someone who's been all across the East Coast, who's seen super amazing things, as, as, as well as maybe some of the really um, touristy things like Peggy's Cove or whatever, um, I did love Nova Scotia, but there was something about New Brunswick while I was there that was very, I think, understated and they didn't feel so much like they had something to prove. They just sort of were. And there's a little town called St. Andrews and it's near the Bay of Fundy. So tides are very high and uh, there's a lot of little things that you can visit around there. But my friend and I went on a trip uh, and at the last minute on the way home, we decided uh, based on a text from another friend saying, have you ever gone to St. Patty's Falls? And we hadn't, and so we decided to. And it was a it was a beautiful trail. It was unmarked. I parked my car on the side of the road, and we just hoped for the best. Um, wandered around, had some vague directions, and found a frozen waterfall that we climbed. Uh, and that was really really cool. And so St. Patty's Falls, outside of St. Andrews, New Brunswick, would be my place in Canada. Thank you for sharing that. We're glad that you uh, survived that pre precarious situation. <laughs> uh, Kareen, I know you have thoughts. I think your your home province just got slammed. So, yeah, and I'm here to de I'm here to defend. Maybe not the politics of. Um, gosh, I mean, if you asked me at different times in my life, I would definitely say different things. But um, I'm going to rep my hometown, Peace River, Alberta. It's been such a long time since I have been able to visit it. And um, uh, it's a 
I like a beautiful valley with a river running through it and yeah, Peace River in the fall and just like all the trees, uh, all the leaves turning color. And there's a particular drive that I had to go uh, on the school bus every morning where you just kind of crest over that hill and the sun is just rising and you can see the water and the beautiful hills and the sunlight kind of dappling all of it. Yeah, that's where I'd go. Beautiful. <laughs> all right, Virginia, I can't wait to hear your answer because I know that usually like here is your answer for like places. Like what's the place, best place, like where I don't have to go anywhere. So, well, I actually have a, I think an okay answer for this one. It's not, and it's not here um, for once. Um, I, I'm going to pick the first city or city that I've been to in Canada before I moved here, Scarborough. Uh, yeah, <laughs> because, and which is weird, because that is the name of the other book that we didn't get to talk about, which I was tempted to read, but um, Scarborough, because before I, before my family came to Canada, um, my sister was already in Toronto, and so that's where she lives, so the first time I set foot in Canada, um, that's where I went, and it was a very strange experience, because Canada is so ginormous compared to Hong Kong, so it's like you drive forever and ever. I'm like, when are we going to get anywhere? What is going on here? Um, and everything is ginormous. Like I remember going to like a superstore. I'm like, whoa, what is this place? Like everything is just really, really strange to me. Um, so yeah, so I think that's probably made the biggest difference because I've like, also there's not really like houses in Hong Kong. So I'm like, houses, what is this? <laughs> like what? So everything was, um, yeah. So that's my first experience of Canada. So I, I think I'm going to pick Scarborough just because of that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Virginia. I definitely know um, some people from Scarborough who will, you know, who, who will die by, by that, by their pride for Scarborough. So I'm sure they're happy to hear that. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Gabriel, for, for doing the East Coast, because I, I, that allows me to pick somewhere here. Um, I actually uh, spent a summer up in Hazleton, uh, BC, which is, you know, halfway up the province, uh, but felt pretty northern. <laughs> um, and it is this uh, beautiful little village. Um, half of it is uh, Gitamax, um, a Gitsan um it's the word I'm looking for, reserve. Um, and the it, the uh, Skeena is going right through the village. Um, and the library that I worked at is like literally like um, 20 feet from the Skeena River. And you wake up in the morning and get there and it's all foggy on the Skeena. And then by the afternoon, it's sunny and beaming down. Um, and the community was just so welcoming to me. Like, I'm not sure I could ever live in a small a town as small as that but um living there for for a time really gave me um an appreciation for these small close-knit communities thank you everybody for for sharing that it uh, kind of like <laughs> i don't know i don't want to say like made me tear up but like <laughs> made me feel kind of a lot of feelings <laughs> Um, so we have one more excellent book to hear about. Uh, Gabriel, I'm going to pass it on to you. All right. So I read Washington Black by Essie uh, Edigen. And so Essie Edigen is a uh, Ghanaian Canadian. She's the first Black woman to win the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Uh, she also wrote a couple other books. Uh, one's called Half-Blood Blues. And the other one is The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, I think is how it's said. Um, and she's also done some nonfiction stuff, but those are her like, bigger novels. Uh, she's very interested in the strange parts of history, is how I've heard it sort of described. And I think that's a good way of uh looking at the way that she kind of pulls stories together strange just in the sense of um they are sort of aspects that you consider almost disparate and she kind of pulls them together to make a new story or something that's maybe not new but it's not something that we're as used to so in washington black in 1830s barbados 
uh, George Washington Black, an enslaved boy, uh, has had to experience some of the cruel realities of living on a sugar plantation. Uh, one bad plantation owner gives way to a worse one as um, Erasmus Wilde takes over and enacts increasingly cruel punishments to the people around Wash. Uh, when he and Big Kit, an older enslaved woman, are summoned to the dinner table to serve Erasmus, he can only assume the worst. But there he meets Christopher Wilde, who's Erasmus's brother. And Christopher, or Titch, uh, as his uh, nickname is, doesn't share most of his brother's views. He's a scientist, and he's actually in the process of creating something called the Cloud Cutter. So enlisting young Wash's help, uh, despite the protests of the plantation owner, um, Wash and Titch embark up the side of a mountain to test out the cloud cutter. Uh, and you can really see, I think, the, the interesting parts of where uh, science and the history of science can kind of intersect with different areas of life. In fact, I'd say that Washington Black, in a lot of ways, is a book about science and a book about um, curiosity from the perspective of Wash. Wash is a very, um, he's a very curious, uh, at the beginning, young man, but um, he's a very curious man and he's a very, uh, I think, scientifically minded person. And so when he gets to kind of go off with Titch, this other character, um, and start kind of getting to actually put different ideas into motion or kind of get an idea of how um, you can go about practicing science, doing experiments, uh, coming up with, with all these things. Uh, it's sort of an interesting dynamic between the two of them because uh, there is such a love. Unfortunately, when testing the cl cloud cutter, something goes a little bit wrong. And soon after, um, they actually meet a another one of the wild brothers, so Erasmus, Christopher, and Philip. And unfortunately, Wash is forced to flee or be blamed for Philip's death because of some things that happened that I don't want to spoil. Which starts the next part of the book um, in which he and Titch sort of begin their escape off the island to America. So the book really has them running around a lot of different places. You see parts of uh, the Underground Railroad for history. Um, you have them looking in the Arctic for lost expeditions. They're evading bounty hunters. Um, Wash actually eventually makes his way to Nova Scotia, which is fun for a Canadian perspective, um, and also to England. And all of which there's, some of it is, is very much um, travel that's influenced by his surroundings and his reality. But a lot of it is also kind of accompanied by Wash's like sense of adventure and his, his love of science. Um, so the book actually takes inspiration from something that happened in real life, in real history. Uh, Washington Black, the character was inspired by Andrew Bogle, who was a formerly enslaved person who was sent after Roger Tichborn who was a man who was shipwrecked and presumed dead. Uh, and uh, Eddie Jen is really good at like, really picking at these little historical threads and then finding the inspiration to put them in the story because it's by no means a one-to-one -one, uh, kind of experience reading it, but you can see where uh, the actual historical um, context comes in and kind of informs the why she would make certain decisions or how she wanted to um, like approach certain certain concepts so while the book is an antebellum novel it also kind of asks what we can do with that genre and also what we can do with post-slavery narratives in general uh wash and titch have a really complicated relationship throughout sometimes i liked it and sometimes i didn't like and i think that was kind of the point was they they do bring out interesting aspects of each other in some ways that are good aspects, but it's also an eye-opening relationship because there's an inherent power imbalance that's kind of baked into the early stuff and the effects of which kind of continue even as Wash gains more and more freedom uh, because it is a relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. And so there's a lot of really interesting things 
I think that are said in the book about it, maybe some of them more explicitly and some of them through implications. Uh, because it's not, um, even though even though it's sort of like a fun adventure book, it's incredibly like fast paced. It still like understands that there are uh, certain aspects of history that you can't really gloss over and uh, that will be sort of present no matter how much you might have fun looking in the Arctic or uh, building aquariums or whatever other um, kind of adventures the characters go on. So it's, I, I would almost say it's kind of similar uh, sounding to Five Little Indians in the sense that there are some very, um, there are some very dark topics that are addressed, but it, the writing style is so fast paced that it's, um, while you kind of have like a visceral reaction to some of it, it's still very like quick to get through. Um, and it doesn't really slow down at all, which for some of sections of the book, I kind of feel like I would have appreciated just because um, she likes to throw twists at you <laughs> and then not really give you time for them to sink in. Um, and so I would learn a whole bunch of information and be reeling from it, but the characters would have kind of moved on. Um, and I'm like, okay, can we hang out here for a little while so they can pick through some emotions and I can pick through some emotions? Uh, but it is really a great book for anyone who likes adventure or historical fiction, as I think it's a really unique take on both. Um, she definitely has a way of making history really fun to read. And as a history major, that's something I always love is uh, being able to sort of take a book like this. And I definitely feel like I could take Washington Black and go up to uh, most of my friends and say, hey, you would like this. You would like this. You're going to have fun reading it. Maybe even if it's not your normal cup of tea, I think it's, I think it's one of those ones that uh, can maybe not in the same way that uh, the other books really push that idea of like one book to, sorry, one book to uh, bind us, rule us all, uh, whatever the non Lord of the Rings version is. Um, uh, while, while the other books, I think, have like very specific takes on it, um, we have uh, a book that is maybe going a different way in, in terms of genre. And so it's sort of saying, hey, we've talked about a lot of the different ideas that are present here in other really, really amazing books. Now we can do something that's maybe a little different. Um, and so especially like as just a story to read, it's got it's got a lot of really cool elements that I think it has something for everyone. So that's why I think it could be the one that binds us all because everybody will find something fun in this book or not so fun, depending on what you're looking for in reading. Okay, so Fiona's right. gone. <laughs> yes, Fiona has a thing um, and Corinne yeah. has a thing. Corinne is also gone. So I feel like uh, it must be our books that won. I think so. Right? You know? I feel like. <laughs> I feel like your book des like deserved to win. This is a very, really, really fun book, but uh, just like the the difference in tone when I was listening to everybody else's books, I was like, I don't think this book is the one. <laughs> but Washington Black and, and I think mine too, like they've both won some other awards already. Yeah. So, you know, they are pretty, yeah. So it's interesting. Um, it's always interesting to see what they pick, um, you know, as books for their for candidate. Canada so, reads. yeah. And yeah. I think, I mean, all five books sounds amazing. And I, I'm pretty sure Scarborough is too. Like I read one of Kevin Hernandez's other book, uh, which we'll talk about on this podcast. And it was amazing. Um, so I'm pretty sure Scarborough is just as good. But yeah, um, yeah. exciting to kind of hear the debates and, um, you know, find out what they say, you know, about the books and, and all the champions. Um, so it looks like uh, just... In case you don't uh, know, March 28th to 31st is when they do the Canada Reads debates. Um, you can tune into the debates on either on radio, on TV, online. So there's multiple ways for you to um, listen to them. Um, so we are going to be, I think by the time this episode air, it will just be before, a couple of days before the actual debate starts. So yeah, um, and I hope you pick up all these books. Um, like Fiona said, we'll all return our copies so that you can get a hold of them <laughs> you know, soon. <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, well, thank you again for joining us for another Keep It Fictional um, 
podcast and also a video chat. Um, we will see you next week again. Bye. Bye. Bye.